Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is feeling well after um, yesterday's kayaking trip, as well as uh, late night entertainment session with invigorating refreshments. Our first speaker today is uh, Neil Dobbs from University College Dublin, and he will talk about upper bounds or house door dimension of Julia sets. Thank you, Sergey. Well, they certainly all look like they're invigorated. It's a great pleasure. A great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to be back after two and a half, three years of pandemic. Uh, it's nice to feel that things are getting back to normal. So, uh, so the conference is on geometric co complexity of Julia sets. And if Felix doesn't object, uh, so the so perhaps the simplest non-trivial complex map with a non-trivial Julia well with uh, yeah with a non-trivial Julia set is Z goes to exponential of Z. But there the Julia set is the whole plane, so it's not particularly complex uh, geometrically. The sort of the first example we really look at is FC map Z to Z squared plus C. So the quadratic family. And one of the uh, ways we can assign some sort of number to ge geometric complexity is to look at the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set. Okay. And it's natural to consider the function, the dependence of the Hausdorff dimension on the parameter C. This is quite a strange and um, irregular function. If you look at the set of points for which Hausdorff dimension of parameters, for which the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set is equal to two, this is contained in the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And if you take the closure, it's actually equal to the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And we should probably modify this slightly just in case the Fatu conjecture isn't true to say that it contains the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. Nevertheless, there are plenty of other parameters on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set where the dimension is less than two, strictly less than two. For the harmonic measure, almost every C in the boundary of the Mandelbrot set Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set this is strictly less than two. So this is due to Shishikura and this to Gracik and Schwiontek. And so this has been, Hausdorff dimension of Julia sets has been studied by a bunch of people. Another important result is by Anja Stunik, which says that if, C is in the Mandelbrot set, but not equal to zero, not equal to minus two. And the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set is strictly greater than one. Okay, so if you're in the Mandelbrot set, your Julia set is connected. So its Hausdorff dimension is at least one. If Z isn't equal, uh, C isn't equal to zero, so you're not the unit circle, and it's not equal to minus two, where the Julia set is an interval, then the Hausdorff dimension is strictly greater than one. And near zero, there's a, uh, an important old result of Ruel, which says that the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set of FC is equal to absolute value of C squared, uh, one plus, the absolute value of c squared over four log two plus higher order terms near zero, near c is equal to zero. Okay, so it's natural enough to ask what happens for c ne near minus two. So for c is equal to minus two, the Julia set is a straight line. So the critical value is minus two. Critical point is at zero. And there's a fixed point at plus two. And zero gets mapped to minus two, minus two gets mapped to two. 
And there's not a whole lot interesting to say about this map, perhaps. So if we want to talk about, have some geometric complexity, we should modify the parameter a little bit. And if we want to stay with it, well, let's keep things simple by considering real perturbations. And if we want to stay within the Mandelbrot set, we should take epsilon greater than zero. In this case, how many colors do we have? Just one. I'm sure there was some orange before. The Julia set is contained in an ellipse. And unlike in Igor's talk, this ellipse is not a circle. So it has height, um, let's say, two times the square root of epsilon. So it'll be contained in some band with the imaginary part is less than square root of two epsilon. The critical value here now will be uh, C here, minus two plus epsilon, minus C will be over here somewhere. And the fixed point at two will have moved a little bit. You get some point here, P, which will depend on C, and it's approximately equal to two minus epsilon over three. So minus C, uh, the interval minus C two will contain the fixed point. Rub this out now, just so. If we take the, this interval here, it's pre-image under F, we're taking the square root, will be a line segment here on the imaginary axis. And because this length here is uh, epsilon, this length here will be square root of epsilon. The height. Okay. So on the large scale, the Julia set is something that resembles a straight line if you zoom out far enough, but just slightly perturbed. There'll also be some crosses here and here. And so on. The Julia set will start, if you start building it, will look something like that. And it's natural to ask, can you say something about the dimension? Is it close to one? And the first result is a lower bound. And this is joint work with Jacek Kracik, who's apparently the same age as me. Thank you, whoever said that this morning. <laughs> and uh, Nikolai Mihalake, who despite the end of the pandemic is locked up with his wife and kids in Romania for the next week in isolation. It's not over yet. And we have a theorem that there exists a constant C greater than zero and just one constant. Just one constant. And the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set is greater than, is less than or equal to one plus constant times square root of epsilon. I guess we need another one, maybe epsilon zero. Lower bound. Thank you. Greater than or equal one plus constant times square root of epsilon for all C in minus two, minus two plus. Uh, epsilon zero. We could put in for all C up until uh, zero minus 
some constant because of Stunix work and some whatever, uh, just by taking C small, the constant C small enough. So really it's, I mean, all we have is a local estimate around minus two. And the ingredients that go into proving this are some inducing. And so we get some uh, uh, counter repeller. Um, Poincare exponent. For those who know what that means. And um, some estimates using a binary tree, which are kind of sort of, we were stuck for a while. And then you do some magic involving an estimate using a binary, you sort of categorize pre-images using a binary tree and, and things. It would be good to introduce the notion of hyperbolic dimension, which is a supremo dimension of, of hyperbolic sets. And you, in fact, by this method, I guess you prove that hyperbolic dimension is bigger. Yeah, so we get the counter repeller, and this gives us a hyperbolic set, subset of the Julia set. Let's say some X subset of the Julia set. And we show that the hyperbolic, uh, the Hausdorff dimension of X is greater than or equal to one plus constant times square root of epsilon. And this set here is hyperbolic. So it's a slightly stronger result than stated here, but thank you, Felix. Okay. And we also have an upper bound. So there exists some other constant. And the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set of C is, I guess it's an upper bound, so less than or equal to one plus constant times square root of epsilon. And now we have a logarithmic correction factor, log of epsilon. And again, we have some constant, epsilon zero. For all C in minus two, minus two plus epsilon zero. And the perceptive among you will know that this cannot be true. Because if you have some renormalization, you can get a sequence of maps where the Hausdorff dimension is bounded by below by 1.1 or 1.2 or whatever. Which, uh, where the parameter is converging to minus two. So because of renormalization, this is impossible. No, because of renormalization. And so it can only be true on a subset of parameters. We already saw here the Hausdorff dimension is really, really, really discontinuous. And that appears on the real, if you restrict to the real line as well. So at minus two, the Hausdorff dimension is discontinuous. And we have to say, intersect some set A, where, and we get a reasonably large subset of parameters. The Lebesgue measure of A intersect minus two minus two plus T. Divided by T converges to one as T goes to zero. So it's a one-sided Lebesgue density point. And once we, so there exists two constants 
and there exists a parameter set A subset minus two zero, let's say. And once we have this parameter set, then we can call it a theorem. I should say as well that for lower bounds of Julia sets, there have been recent work, um, computer assisted proof of lower bounds by Artem, Igors, and Warwick Tucker. They don't give sort of the asymptotic behavior near minus one, but they give computer assisted proofs of lower bounds for the for the entire par parameter interval. Okay, upper bound. So how does one prove upper bounds? One method that has been used very productively and in particular to show that the Hausdorff dimension of Julia sets is less than two if you have some sort of non-uniform, hyper well, hyperbolicity or non-uniform hyperbolicity is the notion of uh, porosity. So for, for porosity, you have your set. And if you look at locally at a point, uh, you'll check all scales, draw a disk of radius R, and look at how much of the set is filled of this disk is filled up by the set whose Hausdorff dimension you want to estimate. And maybe there's some set in the complement. And if at every scale you can show that the that there is some given uh, a disk in the complement whose radius is comparable to the large disk, that of the large disk, then the set is porous. And that will allow you to show that the dimension of a hyperbolic set is strictly less than two. If you want to go to non-uniformly hyperbolic sets, so for example, Julia set of a, um, of a collet Ekman map, then you have to use the notion of mean porosity, which says that you get this at a certain number of scales, a certain proportion of scales. And that also allows you to prove that the Hausdorff dimension is strictly less than two. It seems difficult, at least, to apply the, the idea of porosity to show that the dimension is close to one. But this isn't very useful for proving the upper bound. And there were techniques introduced by uh, my collaborators, Gracik and Mihalake and Peter Jones, which are called beta numbers. And they say, instead of looking for a disk being in the complement, you have a set which you hope is sort of pretty close to a straight line. So you look at a scale and you look at the, the set, and if it's close to a straight line, you should be able to cover it with a strip. And if you can cover it with a strip of size beta, and beta is the smallest width possible. And if this is radius one, then you get a beta number equal to beta. Okay. And then you try it with smaller scales, and maybe you go down here with a, a strip of a disk of radius r, and you still need this size strip. Then you get a number beta divided by the radius. So if you can show that you have control of the beta number at all scales, that allows will allow you, by the work of Gracik, Mihalaki, and Jones, to control the Hausdorff dimension as something close to one, if beta is close to zero if the beta number is close to zero. So our goal now, and again, we're dealing with non-uniformly hyperbolic sets, so we won't be able to get this at every scale. So you take a point X in your Julia set, and you start checking different scales. 
And you look at the beta number at every scale and you try to estimate that. And you want for most scales, you get a very good control of the beta number. And like in mean porosity, where you just need a, a proportion of scales here, you need to get almost, I mean, the proportion of scales has to tend to one, has to be close to one. How are we doing? Good. Okay. So that's one ingredient in the, in the proof. I will give some more ingredients. The, the proof of the lower bound, I mean, there are several steps to the inducing, and you have to do a couple of smart things, but the, the, upper, the lower bound is relatively, compared to the upper bound, is quite straightforward. The, and I spoke about it last, was it last year or the year before, at the online version of this conference. So today I will try to give um, some insight into the upper bound. I'll just note that when you start off, if you take any ball at the large scale, the beta number will be square root of epsilon because you're contained in a horizontal strip of size square root of epsilon. Okay, so we want to go from small scale to large scale quite frequently at a large, for a large set of points. Uh, I needed to use this. The first thing we use, my first ingredient is parameter exclusion. This was also mentioned by Magnus when he was trying to show that, uh, I mean, find a big density point, well, a large set of parameters with certain property. And these ideas go back to Collett and Ekman, to Benedict Carlson, to Jacobson, to Mary Rees and Magnus Aspenberry. Uh, and the conclusion that we're looking for here is that there exists some sequence which is increasing of integers. And nk plus one is less than or equal to one plus some small number tau epsilon times nk. Okay, so it's slowly increasing. And the closer you get to minus two, the slower it increases. And what's important about this is if you take the critical value C, there'll be a disk here, maybe of radius RK, which is mapped by F nk to the large scale. And this is done with bounded distortion. Okay, so this is something that we would like to have for actually every point in the Julia set, well, as many point, a large set of points in the Julia set. You go from the small scale to the large scale with bounded distortion, and then you can pull back this picture to the small scale. This says, if you go close to the critical value, there's a small disk which will get mapped by some iterative f to the large scale. And this happens regularly frequently, relatively frequently. Okay. So the ver this version is a little bit stronger than what you will find in Benedict Carlson, et cetera. So this version is due to Jean-Christophe Yocos. And there are a couple of other ingredients from Yoko's that we use as well. So this gives us our parameter set A. This is true for all C in A. So there exists some parameter set A, which is a, um, and minus two is a one-sided Lebesgue density point for this parameter set. Okay, that's one ingredient. One, two, two, two. Next is the concept of exponential shrinking. We'll continue with the ingredients. Uh, and the conclusion 
is that if U is a connected set and Fn of U is equal to some ball at the large scale, Bz1 for some z, then the diameter, I need a, I need a constant. So there exists some alpha between zero and one. In the paper, it's psi, but it's easier to type psi and to write alpha. Then the diameter of u is less than or equal to alpha to the power of n. So if you take a, a ball at the large scale and you pull it back n steps, it will be exponentially small. And let's say for all large n, maybe n bigger than three or something like that. Okay. And this alpha has to be uniform in C. Okay, so the idea of exponential shrinking for Collet Ekman parameters, these parameters are all Collet Ekman. And they're actually called it Ekman parameters where the exponent is very close to uh, log two. And the constant that goes before is, is as close to one as we want. So uh, this is uniform for all C in A. And so this goes back to um, sort of, uh, Felix Pschetitsky and Stefan Roda use this idea together with mean porosity to prove things about Julia sets. And the version that, uh, in order to get the uniformity in the parameter, we use the paper of Gratschik and Smirnov. Because there, there's some like uh, technical sequences of constants and we can apply those directly. That gives you this exponential shrinking. This is called exponential shrinking. But this is uniform in C. Also from Gratschik and Smirnov, and again building on, I mean, their past work. This past work, there exists a conformal measure, mu c. With exponent delta equal to the Hausdorff dimension. And there exists an absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. And again, we'll cite Gratschik and Smirnov in this, uh, for this again, because we want some uniformity in the estimates for these measures. Okay, a conformal measure is one whose Jacobian is the derivative to the power of the exponent. So for example, Lebesgue measure, as everybody working in complex dynamics famously knows, has exponent equal to two. Let me may I comment uh, in the paper with uh, Juan Rivera and Smirnov, we call this property topological Kolletekman, and it is more, uh, it's weaker than Kolletekman. It is equivalent in presence of one critical point. Sure. Thank you. Artem, you can leave the microphone with Felix. So we'll continue with ingredients and conclusions. Now we maybe need some color. Here we're starting to do some uh, work. We'll call this one, this two, and this three. If you take one and two and three and do some work, we get some new estimates for the conformal measure near the critical value. OK, 
Okay, so the measure of the ball around the critical value is bounded by some constant times the radius to the power of delta, provided r is bigger than, say, epsilon to the power of 1,000. Okay. So Lebesgue measure has the property that if you look at the area of a, the measure of a ball, it's proportional to the radius squared. If you have a conformal measure, you don't get strict proportionality between the radius and the radius to the power of the exponent. It's a property you would like to, be, to have. In some sense, the measure would be more geometric then. It would represent something. And if you have non-uniform hyperbolicity, it's sort of fairly true some of the time. And here in particular, we can show that around the critical value, the conformal measure is bounded by the radius to the power of delta, at least some of the time. And when r is smaller than epsilon to the power of 1,000, we have a slightly worse estimate, r to the power of delta plus some constant s times tau epsilon is less than or equal to the radius, uh, the measure of the ball around c is less than or equal to r to the power of delta minus some constant times tau epsilon. Okay. So tau epsilon is this number here, and tau epsilon goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so it's just some sort of gauge function. So this uh, tau epsilon says, I mean, if, if you think about it, here we have uh, a disk at the small scale getting mapped to the large scale with bounded distortion. This tau epsilon says the next one won't be that much smaller. Okay, and then because of bounded distortion, you can kind of compare the conformal measures and, 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 and this falls out fairly easily. Okay, next thing we need some information on the absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. For those working in the field, we know that near the critical, uh, the critical point zero, the density of this absolutely continuous invariant probability measure will be bounded below. And that means that at the critical value, there's going to be a spike in the density. And at the second iteration, at f of c, there will also be a spike. And at f of f of c, there will also be a spike. And so if you want to control this measure, you have to do some control of the spikes. And from Gatschik and Smirnov, we've got some uniform control on the density. E sigma C, E nu C. So our goal is to try to get enough information on the invariant measure sigma, sigma to use Birkhoff's ergodic theorem to say something about the frequency of things going to the large scale. So we need to study this measure sigma. Okay. Next up. Then we have to do some work. Oh my. We can then get some information, actually get some information about the measure of a ball around zero. The conclusion is that the measure of the ball around zero is bounded by the radius to the power of delta. Of course, this is only going to be true for some range If epsilon is bigger than, I mean, not of course, but uh, sorry, r is bigger than epsilon to the power of 10, say, it's not quite a thousand, it might be the square root of a thousand, and I can't, I should have chosen a hundred. Um, uh, 
Okay, and if r is less than or equal to epsilon to the 10, then this, instead of having r to the power of delta, the constant times that, um, r to the power of four fifths of delta, if r is less than or equal to epsilon to the power of 10. So it's not quite as good, the four fifths of delta. Taking exponents. And I should say that this, uh, so compared to the version on archive, which appeared a year and a bit ago, this estimate is new. I think it's this one. And it improves the results slightly. There was a logarithmic factor as well. And uh, so that meant that this is better than in the archive version. So this one is also new. And it meant that in, for the upper bound, instead of having a factor log of epsilon to the power of three over two, we have a factor log of epsilon. So it's some small improvement. But these results are new for the uh, invariant measure and the conformal measure. 10, 12 minutes, 20. Okay, and what ingredients go into proving this? Well, we need, let's say, uh, four and five. And uh, just to prove that it's like deep work, we use the Holder inequality. And we use shrinking neighborhoods. So which uh, is an idea that can be traced back to Chetitsky and Anya and uh, Mariusz Szurbanski. And that allows us, I mean, gives you some distortion control of some sort. And you put all that together and cry for a while, um, you can show this. Okay, don't ask me how. And now we're getting somewhere. We have a measure of a ball of radius r around the critical point. Uh, yeah, around the critical point zero. And the critical point zero are the problem, problematic points when you want to go from small scale to large scale with bounded distortion. You don't want to hit the critical point. So now we want to get a conclusion is some sort of frequency of good scales. And we can't get it for every point, but we can get it for most points. And for that, we need as ingredients, uniform exponential shrinking. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, this is six. We need the estimate of the measure of uh, balls around zero and Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Okay. And then if you have frequency of good scales, call this seven. And the conclusion is the theorem holds. Okay, so if there are any questions, I'll take questions now, and then I will give a um, quick explanation of how one obtains the, or how the critical point at zero 
interacts with uh, this as um, exponential shrink and Birkhoff to give frequency of good scales. That's not the end of the talk. That's just a, if somebody has a question, it would be a good point to ask. Oh, you have a question. Yeah. Ah. Is seven different from one? Uh, there is also some frequency of scales. So this is frequency of good scales for the critical value, the point C. The whole point of all this work is to guess, uh, and I will say in a second, that this is for a large set of points. So you choose any po a point at random with respect to sigma, and that point will have a sequence of good scales. Thank you. Good question. OK, so I will uh, rub out most of this. Well, that's the uh, do, do, do. this special. OK. OK, so for the frequency estimate, So there exists some set x with uh, sigma x equal to one, where Birkhoff averages converge. Okay, nothing too dramatic there. And so if you choose a point in this set, it will visit the ball of radius r with frequency r to the power of delta. Okay, so what, what do you do then? Uh, so you choose X in X. And we look at the integers. I'm going to have to, and so we have zero, one, two, and then we've got some scales, some times NJ. We've got X, F of X, F and J of X. Okay, and I'm going to have to rub out what exponential shrink is. Hopefully, it's not. That if you choose a point, uh, so it has, it's a full measure set. And if you choose a point X in X, it will visit balls with frequency corresponding to the measure. So that's what you're just telling us. You're telling us what the properties are that your X has. Okay. Uh, I said it verbally, I'm not going to, am I going to, um, yeah. This is a property that X has. It will visit a ball around zero with frequency corresponding to the diameter of the ball. And then you can look at times and at time NJ, you're at a point F NJ of X and maybe here you are very close to zero. Okay, it's less than square root of epsilon. That tends to be a, a number that pops up a while frequently in the proof. And we'll even say it's um, like two to the minus kj times epsilon, where kj is some positive integer. And then we keep on going along. We iterate, iterate, iterate. And we get to nj plus some constant times uh, square root of, what do we want? Log of epsilon plus kj. And we, then we look at any point n, any integer n greater than that. And so you're at some point fn of x here. And you take a ball at the large scale. And you say, what happens when you pull it back along the orbit? So k is some large number. We 
which depends on alpha and not much else. Well, when you pull it back here, you'll get some ball u, and the diameter of u is less than or equal to alpha. That was the exponential shrinking factor times or to the power of k log epsilon plus kj. And this is less than or equal to 2 to the minus kj times square root of epsilon. So in particular, zero is not contained here. So the fact that you passed close to zero won't affect going from small scale to large scale for very long. There's some interval here, which is bad. And then beyond that, that passage close to zero doesn't have any effect. And how much do you lose? How many bad, how many bad times are there? The frequency that this happens The frequency will happen with 2 to the minus kj times square root of epsilon. times the cost. K log epsilon. Sorry, this should be a plus uh, kj. So this is the cost. And if you sum this up over J, then hopefully you get something that is less than or equal to a constant times square root of epsilon times log of epsilon. Okay, I've cheated a little bit that I haven't um, split it up into two cases, r to the power of delta and r to the power of 4 of 5 delta. Um, there is a delta here somewhere. Delta is bigger than one, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so these are bad integers. Um, I've got something a little bum 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 frequency cost. All right, the density, this is the density of bad integers, I think. Question? So, sorry. so you're saying what you're estimating is the density of the, of the bad, pullback, bad times for pulling back your yeah. of definite size. So you start off at, you go like from one up to some large time n. And the proportion of bad integers should be some constant times square root of epsilon times log of epsilon times n, at most. Okay. And it's not quite true that all other integers are good, but it's almost true. Okay. So there's some additional estimates that you have to do, but other estimates or other integers are good. You can almost pull back the large scale to the small scale. For some of them, you can, and for others, you can do a little trick that are good. And then you do some a little bit of work to go from good integers, good times to good scales. And that will give you plenty of good scales around almost every point. Oh, uh, seven plus beta numbers. 
Okay, then you just apply the beta number machinery of Gratchik, uh, Jones, and Mihalake, and the theorem works, holds. Okay, I think time is uh, strangely up right at the good moment. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil. Are there any questions? Thanks very much for the interesting talk. Um, I, I would like to, to uh, I have a comment about the uh, kind of introduction. You mentioned that, um, that the Hosler dimension cannot be close to one everywhere because of renormalization. But in fact, there is another reason. It's a parabolic implosion. And uh, what, what we proved with uh, Michel Sonsmeister is that um, there is an open uh, set of pa real parameters C, which is uh, dense in, in the set of non-hyperbolic parameters, such that for each C from this uh, open dense set, uh, the host door dimension is bigger than four or three because of parabolic implosion. So it's very, very precise. I um, neglected to say that the results by uh, Levin and Zinsmeister and also uh, Jakstas and Zinsmeister and probably plenty of other people I'm forgetting on Hausdorff dimension of interval maps. Thank you for the comment, uh, Gennady. Also Avila and Morera. Um, thank you. Uh I wonder, are there any expectation or is there like understanding what would happen if one per top into the Hannon maps? What would happen with the estimates? Uh, yeah, I meant to say that part of the motivation is to, oh, as a part of the motivation was there's a question of Jean-Christophe uh, Jean Yoko's about the Hausdorff dimension of Hannon maps when you're close to um, the perturbation of minus two. Uh, we're not there yet. I don't know if we're going there or not. Um, but yeah, that, that is one of one of the motivations for studying Julia sets for C close to minus two. And uh, am I correct that kind of uh, lower estimate is fine or sort of plus maybe there will be a Jacobian or are there some issues also with the uh, estim estimation from uh, below? below? Uh, so you, you had uh, two estimates. The lower estimate and the upper estimate, and yeah. in the lower estimate, it's estimated by a, by a, a recognizing a, a hyperbolic set that should have kind of a nice perturbation. Kind of with yeah, that so estimate, I, would everything be fine, or are there also some subtleties? Uh, probably. Uh, just, I, just I don't curious. know. <laughs> okay, I don't. Yeah, just curious. We should ask uh, John Gook. Um, Lasse. So if I understand correctly, your set of parameters that you're looking at, it's um, topological collar Ekman maps with some additional control on the constants kind of involved, which are kind of uniform and possibly getting better as you go towards one that. Uh... Yeah, so if you, uh, I mean, if your question is about this, so if you consider the, uh, let's say the first return map to minus Q, Q, Q minus Q, where these are the Q is the internal fixed point, then there'll be a central branch of size square root of epsilon. And there'll be some complex branches. And Yokoz's condition, I mean, his uh, one of the things that he requires is that the first large number of iterates only pass by, the first large number of returns only pass by the non-central branches. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that allow gives you some very good starting control. And then the other condition is that the frequency with which you pass by the central branch is not too high either. Okay, so, so it's a bit more than just saying it's Kolle Ekman. It's, 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 it's more than just Kolle Ekman. Yeah. So, so my question was going to be: Do you get any? You get a lot of new estimates, right, for the various measures and so on. Whether you get any estimates that work for all Kolle Ekman maps. Um, which then give you your result for the specific set or whether it's a situation where you really need this extra 
this so kind of extra structure for this sort of fine estimate uh, and the equivalent for the conformal measure we do use the starting condition i don't know i mean somehow uniform colored ekman means that you maybe you have you pass a few times by the central branch but you don't go too deep ever mm. and so that it might still be possible okay thank you. i don't know but this like this epsilon to the power of a thousand does come from the starting condition and we need like at least epsilon squared mm. for our results okay thank you very much thanks Lasse. for coletech man you can go often to large scale with bounded criticality which might be helpful i don't know because this bounded criticality allows to transport back conformal measure at least by splitting into annual line yeah so maybe this would be enough and improve something it might <laughs> then additional, so additional I mean, conditions wouldn't be needed yes any more questions here are there any uh questions from online what do we have online i have a short question yes or no question so no it <laughs> It appears, yeah. So it appears that your message can be used to go outside of the real lines. Is it true? Uh, certainly the lower bound and uh, some stuff should be true for the upper bound as well. Yes. I mean, we had it. I mean, I think this question was asked a year or two ago and it was true then and it was half written up then and it's still half written up now. We just don't quite know. Revisions of this uh, were taking priority over developing new stuff. Thanks, Magnus. But yeah, this lower bound holds for, for I mean, the lower bound holds for all parameters in a, in some, if we pretend this is minus two in the Mandelbrot set, <clears throat> there's some region there which contains the, the tip of the Mandelbrot set, all parameters in the Mandelbrot set near minus two, for which the lower bound is still true. More questions? Questions from online audience? Well, let, let's thank uh, Neil again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll probably need about five minutes to set up our next speaker. So.